Um, welcome, Peter. Uh, great to have you with us again. For all of those of you who don't know, uh, Peter is a fellow member. He's also the director of the Skoll Centre for Social Entrepreneurship up in Oxford um, and is a kind of global health specialist and expert as well. So welcome, Peter. Good to be back. Hi, everyone. So um, why don't we start with, as we all, always do, with a sort of a look at the sort of UK. I mean, just before we kicked off um, this webinar, you were telling me about a conversation you had this morning uh, with a number of sort of different um, educators and sort of faculty members of schools across the country. Um, obviously, with schools opening on Monday, how do we make smart decisions about what we should and shouldn't be doing? What is the healthcare advice we should be following? Uh, what is the government advice we should be, should we be following? And as for many people joining this call as parents, you know, as you say, how do we make smart decisions at, at times like these? Yeah, thanks. Um, it was a great conversation this morning with one of the, there's two big unions of um, head teachers of school and college leaders. And I was with one called ASCL, ASCL. Um, and, uh, and, and so we had a nice webinar discussion with, um, uh, with a number of school leaders across the country um, about what they're seeing, the guidance they're getting and sort of what to do. And it's challenging. There's so much that you know, we can and should talk about around reopening and whether it's the right time to be doing some of the reopening, whether we're ready in terms of the case numbers, whether we're ready in terms of the infrastructure of test, trace and isolate, um, but it's happening um, and schools were told they you know, start to reopen um, in this in this limited capacity, um, and so we're sort of learning. We're learning as we go. The, this, there's so much science that's still out on children, um, uh, and that makes it really difficult, right? There's some evidence that suggests that kids are um, a little bit less likely to get infected, perhaps. Um, that at least younger kids might be less likely to transmit, and that in general, most kids fare pretty well with the infection. Many don't have symptoms or have very mild symptoms, but as we've talked about here in the past, there is that very small subset that go on to develop really severe disease. So there's some reasons to be more confident um, about, um, ab about kids getting back to things. And, and one of the reasons I think that the decision was made to start mostly with early years kids, nursery reception in year one, was that both the risk seemed a little bit lower to them and of transmission, and then also kind of the, the, the risk of keeping younger kids out of school for longer might be a little bit higher because early childhood education is is so, so important. Um, but there are a bunch of big caveats that a lot of things that we don't know about how to do it safely. Um, and so I think that it's, what we've seen is that probably around the country, maybe just over half of the schools have actually reopened um, this week in that very limited capacity. Um, whereas at least from some of the early surveys I've seen, 40 something percent have not opened yet. Um, and there are a variety of reasons for that. What's gonna be really important is that we have much better surveillance. And so, so that in a, in locally you understand what your situation is. We know that transmission's never been equal. Um, you know, a short while ago, London was really hot and the hospitals were overwhelmed and we saw an extraordinary amount of trans transmission there. Whereas other parts of the country, it was relatively quiet. Now to some extent that's shifted and in the Midlands and certain parts of the country, we saw a lot more more transmission. So we need to understand that local conditions are going to need to be taken into account. And rather than just having these kinds of blanket, you know, lockdowns, a blunt instrument, how can we be smarter in using the data that we have to decide in this particular area, it's safe. In that particular area, it may not be safe yet. And how do we make sure that we have enough intelligence that we can pull back if we need to? So we talked about having a, a, a trigger. In Germany, they call it an emergency break. If the R goes above a certain level or you see new cases at a certain level, then you start to kind of pull back. Um, so frankly, I don't think the UK is ready for schools to open yet. Um, but they are, and um, at least it's very slow and cautious. And um, I, you know, I think schools are doing a nice job with the guidance and the resources they have. And so the way I see it is the next six weeks are gonna be not a period of intense education, but a period of really important learning about what it's gonna take to do this safely, what works and what doesn't work. Um, and so um, rather than kind of rushing back, I've really encouraged school leaders to think about this as a time to, um, to learn from one another, to try out their protocols and to, you know, hopefully then we come back in September, it's going to be by no means normal, but we're going to need to learn how to adapt. And so maybe it's going to be rota systems where you have one week on and one week off when you're physically in school and then the odd week, you know, you're going to be 
home and getting remote learning, something like that could work well and allow for some distancing. Um, but we don't know. And there's experiments that are happening all over the world right now, um, places that are way ahead of us. We need to learn from them. We need to learn from each other. And so that's what I see happening over the next six weeks. And I'm actually happy if we move a little bit more slowly on that and then take a step back, take all the information that we've got and we've learned and say, how do we really plan for the next academic year that in this kind of strange new world, we can deliver awesome education, um, you know, under these kinds of new new terms and, and, and new circumstances. And in relation to the sort of R level that you're mentioning, obviously there's there's lots of news of what, the, of what the R level actually is and how important it is to, you know, releasing lockdown and, and us coming out of, of easing that. Um, you just mentioned this kind of trigger point though for sort of schools and educators specifically. Um, is that something the kind of government is looking at you know, you mentioned Germany actually has what this trigger level is. Is that different to what we're sort of saying um, in the UK that our level should be? I'd, I'd just love some more sort of clarity on that because it always seems a little bit up in the air in terms of what's that number that we're actually going for and we should be really concerned about. Yeah, so the R is a, is, a, is a marker of how much transmission is happening, right? So for the quick primer, it's how many people I infect, the average infected person infects or secondary transmission. When you do nothing and everything is normal, it's two and a half to three. That leads to exponential growth, right? We know that is a bad thing. Um, we want it to be less than one uh, because that means that for every new case, there's going to be fewer than one additional case and therefore over time the epidemic will start to decrease. That's what lockdown has been all about, a very blunt powerful instrument to do so. Places where you have a really strict lockdown like uh, in China that the R went down to like 0 0.3. We probably never got that close here because our lockdown was a lot looser, right? Lots of us were able to go out and go for a walk and go cycling and go to the grocery store and things like that. Um, where does it come from first? It comes from modeling, right? And so we've seen, we've all lived and learned the promise and the peril of modeling, right? That this is sort of advanced statistics where you have to build in a whole bunch of assumptions and it can be really dangerous because you, you know, if you have sort of bad or uncertain data that's coming into the model, you can get a sort of, you know, shiny, very clear looking number that may actually be based on a lot of incorrect assumptions. Um, and that's why in general with modeling, we try to look at that as a, as a range of scenarios or possible futures. Um, so the R number is, is not perfect. And that's why it usually is reported as a range. So we're often hearing now that the R is somewhere between 0 0.7 and 1. Um, and that's gonna vary a little bit from place to place. Part of it is that we don't have great intelligence. We don't have good testing yet, right? We're only getting one out of four tests of the 8,000 new or new cases every day. We're only getting about one in four of them. So instead we're relying on hospitalization rates, death rates to kind of infer the R. Um, so we know that it is probably just below one, um, but that's a fairly thin margin. And we've seen in other places when they start to open back up, it doesn't take much for that R to then tip again um, above one. All we've heard from government on this is that it's important to keep the R under one. They will continue to report it. And if it goes up, then we may have to pull back. Um, but there's not a clear policy around that. Um, it's among the sort of five tests that are off-cited and sometimes followed. Um, the R number hasn't been published um, as regularly over the last several days. We sort of hear it in press conference, but it's not being released along with some of the testing data, which I find kind of curious. Um, so it's only one number um, and it's useful. And I do think that what would be helpful is if um, the government were able to start publishing the R on a regional basis. So you could look at sort of London and the Southeast and the different parts of the country where there's gonna be variability. And it might be that if it starts to creep up in one particular place, and that might be because of, because of a super spreader event. This happened in South Korea where there was a, um, a sort of spike in cases that were all connected to sort of one person in a bar. And in that area, they had to sort of shut stuff down. About a couple of hundred schools were closed and they worked to contain that specific area, but didn't sort of lock down the entire country. I think that would be quite useful. In Germany, what they did actually with the emergency break was not based on the R specifically, but on the number of new cases. And I believe it was 50 cases per 100,000 people. And if the level went above that in any one of the sort of parts of Germany, um, they'd have to sort of pull back. 
And that was a way of giving local authorities or states more control over what was happening in the pace of reopening, but saying, look, across the board, we're not gonna tolerate um, transmission getting above a certain level. We gotta kind of nip this in the bud. So those are some ways of, um, of managing the almost inevitable kind of uptick in cases. And we desperately need to avoid is getting behind the curve again as things start to increase, because we know from painful experience that once you get a couple of weeks behind this virus, you're in a very dangerous place. Yeah, exactly. Um, and with obviously, I mean, as you say, you're, you're happy that schools are kind of taking this very slowly, but with obviously the economy just generally starting to reopen up and, and lockdown easing across the country, um, how do we make also smart decisions in relation to going to work, seeing our friends and family? Um, you know, on the weekend, there were plenty of pictures of people down on the beach and thousands of people back on the beach, very much not socially distanced. Um, so what are the kind of decisions that we should be making? How can we protect ourselves? And I guess the question of should we be wearing face masks when we're going out and about? What are the ways in which we can kind of be very practical about coming out of, of lockdown, getting a kind of sense of sanity back, but also still being kind of healthy and, and protected? Yeah, I'm worried about what's happening right now. Everything has just gotten messy. You know, I think that messaging that we're getting about um, lockdown has been confusing, right? And sometimes, in some cases, it's signaled really early on, and they'll release some scientific advice that, you know, sort of is behind the decision. And then at other times, we'll see a tweet at 10 p.m. on a Saturday night that says, oh, if you've been shielding, you know, starting tomorrow, you can go outside again without consulting, you know, the medical community, without giving any kind of warning. Um, and so different things are kind of coming out at different days. There doesn't appear to be a very coherent strategy. And, and that's, I think, fomenting a lot of confusion. It's hard, even for me as someone who's covering this or following this incredibly closely to really understand what we can and can't do. And so what does that mean for everybody else who's just turning on the news every night trying to figure this stuff out? Um, I think that's compounded by the kind of politicization, the trust issues um, around the Cummings affair and kind of everything else that just now everyone seems to be at loggerheads around all of this stuff. Every decision comes under a microscope and a lot of criticism. It's incredibly hard to follow. And on, you know, on top of that, people are anxious to get out and about and get back to normal, to see their loved ones, to, um, to get outside on a beautiful day during the bank holiday weekend and all that. It's a, it's a mix that I think is ripe for um, moving to quickly and not methodically and so that the risk there is number one that we start to see a spike in cases and then number two because we're kind of doing things in a haphazard fashion rather than saying we're going to sort of make this change at this time and that change at that time it's hard for us to know which one is causing which effect if that makes sense and so it's going to be hard to learn if something goes wrong what went wrong um, if that makes sense. So for individuals, it's difficult. What I would say is remember that we are still in a period of high transmission, 8,000 new cases every single day in this country by the government's estimates, three quarters of which are not being diagnosed. Everyone who has symptoms is meant to be able to get a test now, and that's a good step forward, um, uh, but we still need to see more um, on that. So, so I think the risk is still out there. Um, and, um, and we should be cautious, particularly those of us who are medically vulnerable or have vulnerable ones in our families. So um, my bias, as it were, is to be cautious about this. So we made the decision not to um, put our kids back in school, even though we have a year one and nursery kid. Right now, we wanted to wait a few weeks and see what, what direction this kind of goes to before we felt comfortable doing that. Um, I think if you can work from home, you should continue to work from home um, as much as possible. Um, I think that, you know, um, not being profligate, I wouldn't be going back out to, um, uh, to lots of shops and other kinds of things like that. But when you do use smart precautions, so they're hopefully all shops are going to be sort of COVID secure and have distancing measures in place and hand sanitizer and things like that. One thing that we are not paying enough attention to in this country that all of you can start doing if you're not doing it already is wearing a face covering. And I say face covering instead of mask because it's not to confuse it with the kind of medical masks which are still in short supply and we, most of us don't necessarily need for being out and about. Um, the evidence continues to grow that face coverings when worn in a widespread fashion can really reduce transmission in a meaningful way. So remember, my mask is not to protect me from infection. My mask is to protect 
you from infection. So it's sort of an active solidarity. And about 40% or more of all transmission of COVID-19 comes from people who are not having any symptoms, who feel as great as I do right now. Um, and I could be infectious without knowing it and then fall ill in a couple of days. So that's why every time I go into the shop, if I'm wearing a face covering, I can really reduce the chance of infecting someone else. So just over the last couple of weeks, we've found that um, a couple of studies um, one from China that was looking at mask wearing in households that were kind of self-isolating and found that transmission within households, if I'm infected but asymptomatic and I'm wearing a mask, my family is almost 80% less likely to become infected if I'm wearing a mask in the household. Um, and it, almost as significant a drop was found in a big review that was published in Lancet this week. So um, you, we didn't know this before because a lot of the studies of masks were studying whether my mask protects me. But as we start to look at whether my mask protects you, we find that that's significant. So um, what I'd like to see is, masks or face coverings on almost everybody when we're out and about in public, certainly in enclosed spaces, when that, whether that's shops, places of worship when we get back to it, I think it needs to be looked at in schools. Um, and so if you don't have a face covering, get one or make one and we need to make that routine. Um, but I think that government needs to revisit this evidence and be much stronger about that as a guidance. It seems like a low hanging fruit and uh, in a really easy win. And not only that, again, as I said before, it's an act of solidarity. And I think we need a little bit more of that right now. It feels like everyone's kind of pulling apart a little bit. So let's come back together and this can be part of our own national effort to move forward. I think I know what your answer is going to be to this question, but I'm, I'm interested to know the answer just simply because um, the UK has an interesting policy on it and um, the kind of world in general is opening up. So holidays, um, obviously lots of European countries are opening their borders. Um, a lot of European countries are trying to advertise people to come on holiday this year um, to really re rebuild their economies, which are, you know, primarily um, dominated by tourism in some cases, and if not, just to kind of refill the economy, obviously. Um, you know, the UK has put in a, a quarantine rule, but only starting shortly, I hadn't brought it in before. So I guess just as we all think about coming out of lockdown and actually wanting to travel to see loved ones who might be living in Europe, um, or, you know, wanting to go back to the US or um, wanting to just have a bit of sanity and, and get out and actually have a holiday. Um, what would be your advice around um, whether you should be going or you shouldn't? Yeah, we'll see whether it's possible. I mean, at the moment, because this quarantine is coming into effect, as far as we know, and will be in effect for some time, as far as we know, right, it's possible. We've heard all kinds of rumors, right, over the last couple of days that maybe it won't totally be implemented or they will, and then after a few weeks, they'll pull back. Um, there's talk about this notion of air bridges, which would be sort of making an agreement between the UK and other countries that have low transmission to say, between us, the risk is probably low enough that we don't have to have the quarantine for these particular countries. What is curious about that is that we're a high transmission country right now, right? There's a lot of transmission here. So some other countries have already said, we're not ready to accept travelers from the UK. Greece, um, for example, or Greece and Spain, and I think Greece reversed it. So there's some back and forth, but some countries that sort of say they're not ready because a lot of other places have bent their curve much more than we have in the UK and are in settings of low transmission, whereas we're still at relatively high transmission. So the risk is more that we take infection out when we go other places, even more so than bringing it back Back in at the moment to be to be frank um, I would say first off just economically um, don't spend a lot of money buying airplane tickets and booking hotels and things for a holiday that's a month or two away unless you have insurance or something where you know that it's going to be refundable because we just don't know where all of this is going right we don't know whether the quarantine will stay in place and maybe you can tolerate that and you can you can manage a two-week quarantine when you get back home to the UK um, we don't know what's going to happen um, any day there could be a, you know, there could be a spike in Greece and Santorini shuts down for a period of time or something, right? This is not over. And so there's that uncertainty and you have to decide how much uncertainty you want to live with um, uh, when thinking about, you know, whether it makes sense to take your holidays. So for me, 
um, it's a little bit early. There's a little bit too much uncertainty. And um, this is a big, beautiful country with lots of lovely spots. And um, maybe I'm biased because I haven't been here that long and there's lots of interesting places for me to visit. Um, but spend some time outdoors and uh, try to find a way to, to make a holiday here within the country. Um, and that may be a smarter and safer approach for, for right now. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so maybe in the seven minutes we have left, just a, a call out to everyone on the call. If you have any questions, please do ask them via the Q&A box. Um, but maybe let's take a little bit of a, a tour around the world. Um, so going to the US and obviously behind you, you have the Black Lives Matter poster. Um, given what we know globally, um, especially in the kind of UK and the US around, um, you know, ethnic minorities being adversely affected by COVID, um, disproportionately so. Um, and obviously that with the backdrop of what's happening in the US um, as a result of sort of George Floyd and, and other sort of police brutality, et cetera, happening in the US. Um, you know, how can we think about kind of the future of healthcare and sort of racial inequality in healthcare? How do we bridge that divide um, and ensure that you know, everybody has quality access to healthcare and that we actually have the data on the healthcare that we actually need um, to be able to administer um, good healthcare for? Yeah, it's been a very trying week in America and uh, for those of us who are American and, and um, uh, and obviously, you know, care about these issues um, that the, you know, the, the um, uh, events in the wake of George Floyd's assassination and several other events that kind of happened in relatively quick succession, um, shocking events, but, but the sorts of things that we've seen again and again and again and again, all kind of came to a head with the pandemic and the disproportionate burden on communities of color. I mean, um, you know, uh, uh, Black and Latino individuals are twice as likely to die of COVID-19 in places like New York City. That's a little bit less stark here, um, but extremely significant, right, for reasons we've talked about and can go more into. Um, the, the, the economic effects of the lockdown in terms of unemployment and poverty have hit communities of color. So all of these things, right, are kind of reinforcing one another in that sort of underlying pandemic of institutional racism that has been there for a very long time, you know, sort of came to a head and, and intersected with the, the, the pandemic in these, um, uh, in these really um, uh, difficult but important ways. And um, it's been, it's been hard, to, hard to see this. Um, and of course, there's a lot been made about the risks of having lots of people out in the streets um, during a pandemic. And I think that's um, it's a legitimate concern, but frankly, I think that people need to be um, in the streets right now. And I was in the streets um, uh, earlier today, as, as we talked about, Joe, at a, at a Black Lives Matter event here in Oxford. Um, I think we need to be out there and, and doing it as safely as possible. But, um, you know, racism is fueling um, some of the damage that the virus is causing, and it's not going to go away unless we do something about it. Um, and it is possible to protest safely. Um, uh, unfortunately, it hasn't been happening. So, um, so it's just, it's, um, we could have a long conversation about what's happening in the US, obviously, and a lot of other people would have uh, important insights as well. Um, but it's been, it's been painful, uh, but it's out there. And I think that we need to continue, um, uh, we need to continue our advocacy and activism um, because because uh, it's not going away. And again, this is sort of a twin pandemic situation. So um, I don't know what it's all going to mean for COVID-19 over the weeks to come. We'll see. Um, it certainly hasn't helped that even folks who are peaceful protesters who are out in the streets wearing masks and trying to distance a little bit are being attacked with tear gas and having to pull off their masks and, and suffering, you know, lung inflammation and injury from the tear gas and the, um, you know, the other kind of riot control techniques. And so that's all kind of making that escalation is making the whole situation worse, but also is going to increase the, the public health risk. So, um, so we may see that worsening, but in general, the picture in the US COVID-19 wise remains fairly difficult. Um, we're still seeing infections going up in um, 18 or 20 states um, and lots of other places. It's kind of flat or decreasing a little bit, but the pandemic is no means behind us there. 
a lot of states opened up while they were already still having increases in cases. And so um, what's difficult is probably still going to get worse before it gets better. And now that we've got this other kind of crisis engulfing, it's going to be um, even more difficult to sort of maintain focus on what we need to do to control the virus. Um, so that's, yeah, again, conversation in itself. Elsewhere in the world, um, Latin America over the last couple of weeks has really emerged as the um, the big hotspot, the Americas in general, but now Latin America, um, we've seen a, a very significant surge in cases um, headlined by Brazil, which we talked about way back in, um, gosh, I think early April, um, because Bolsonaro was sending all the Trumpian signals of mismanaging this. And even today he's saying, yeah, it's bad, but, you know, sort of these are the sacrifices people are making. Um, they've just had an extraordinary exponential growth in cases uh, across the country, um, uh, particularly affecting sort of the Amazon region, one of the poorest parts of the country. Um, and it shows no signs of letting up. And unfortunately, it's not just Brazil. We've seen high numbers in Chile and a number of other Latin American countries all the way up to Mexico. So if you look at the global situation, you know, the even though parts of Europe, for example, have sort of come down and we're starting to see these signs of opening back up. Obviously, some parts of Asia, New Zealand has declared themselves coronavirus free. Overall, globally, we're still seeing a pretty steady rise in the number of cases. The pandemic is just shifting um, to different places. And so it remains really an ongoing, um, an, an ongoing concern. Um, Africa has continued to sort of evade um, uh, the worst of the pandemic so far. And it's a credit to a lot of the strong early action taken in a number of those countries. Um, we are seeing situations like South Africa where lockdowns are e being eased up. And I think it's, it's at some point maybe they have to be, um, but in settings of still increasing transmission. And so questions really remain about um, what's going to happen there. Again, it's all a reminder that these are early days in this pandemic, that this is not uh, by any means behind us um, here in the UK or in the world, um, that we're in mile three of a marathon and we need to prepare for 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 the long haul um, until that vaccine comes so a, a very specific question in in from a member but um for countries um such as myanmar um and you know countries in, in southeast asia which have always had sort of direct flights into wuhan and you know very strong connections with with china how are they still reporting sort of just 250 cases yeah, good question. I don't know specifics on Myanmar. I can look into it for next week. Um, but I mean, the, the two possibilities are, number one, that they actually haven't had very many cases. Well, I guess a couple of possibilities, right? So, um, you know, in some places that have had strong early action, um, they've been able to limit sort of the importation of this. And it's a little bit haphazard, right? We talked, I think, last week about our increased understanding about the importance of super spreader events, that 80% of transmission seems to come from 20% of infected people. So for reasons we don't understand, I may be infected and you, Joe, may be infected at the same time. And one of us is incredibly contagious and one of us is not. Um, and so what that means is it's a little bit of a crapshoot. Somebody coming off a plane with an infection might really seed a significant sort of epidemic in a place um, and another day they may not. Um, so there's a little bit of a roulette wheel element to this kind of early on. And um, that plus early action helps some places um, avert it and avoid it. Obviously, um, not having access to testing um, as a number of low and middle income countries um, faced early on means you're not going to have reported cases because you're not doing a lot of tests. Um, but the other thing that you'd always be concerned about, particularly in a country with a history of non-transparent government and human rights issues, etc., is that they're just covering things up um, or they're not reporting accurately those figures. And, um, and we've seen that in, in, in various places, you know, Iran um, early on. Iran, by the way, in our world tour is now is the first place I've seen with what looks like a proper second wave or second spike in infections over the last couple of weeks. They were hit pretty hard early on. It came down, but if you look like it, it's starting to look like that two humped camel that we saw in all those 1918 Spanish flu um, diagrams. So that's that's really concerning. Um, so I don't know the situation, but it's probably one or some combination of, uh, of those things. And I realize we're out of time, but I would be remiss not to sort of throw in some sort of positive note in terms of kind of treatments, trials, uh, vaccines. So I know I read today um, there's some promising things around ibuprofen and the use of ibuprofen. So maybe just last question on sort of developments and treatments and clinical trials and, and vaccines. 
Yeah, I've got a lot of questions about ibuprofen today because remember in the beginning, we were all told don't take ibuprofen if you think you have COVID. That was just based on speculation with some other respiratory um, viral infections. Ibuprofen is associated with kind of a worse course. Um, it just kind of, you know, makes your body respond less well. And so the thinking was, well, it could be the case for COVID. So just in case, use paracetamol for your fever control um, or your pain rather than ibuprofen. Um, it was subsequently sort of found that there doesn't seem to be harm from COVID-19. And so in general, we think ibuprofen is probably fine. Um, there was an announcement about this new trial looking at ibuprofen as a therapeutic. Now, it's a very specific thing. This is not like an antiviral. The idea is not that ibuprofen can kill the coronavirus. Um, the idea is that, that ibuprofen has anti-inflammatory properties that might help with the inflammation that makes people so sick. Um, so remember, in the people who end up in the ICUs or ITUs on ventilators and things, what's happening is their body is having this overwhelming kind of inflammation in the lungs and elsewhere um, uh, that's sometimes called acute respiratory distress syndrome that is actually what makes people so sick. So some of the treatments that are being tried right now are things that can reduce inflammation to try to blunt that body's, the body's response and, um, and improve the course. So, um, so my understanding is that, that the study is looking at ibuprofen as a treatment for people who are severely ill to try to prevent them from going over the edge and needing a ventilator. So um, super interesting. It doesn't mean that you should start taking ibuprofen if you think you have COVID. I mean, it might help with your fever, but it's not necessarily going to, um, you know, otherwise um, help just like you shouldn't be taking hydroxychloroquine, um, you know, call your doctor, get a test um, and, and, and go from there. So that's, that's sort of an interesting development in the, in the scientific literature, the most important and exciting stuff for me, honestly, has been some of the face covering literature, which I already talked about. Um, remdesivir, the antiviral that was approved in the US and then last week was approved here in the UK for emergency use, um, has now been approved in India as well. So it's sort of making its way out into more widespread use and still hopeful that we'll learn more about um, its uses, particularly earlier on in the infection, whether that can be um, a, a useful way of, um, uh, you know, of, of reducing mortality. Um, and the vaccine race continues. I haven't seen um, any important developments um, uh, of any of the major candidate vaccines over the last um, seven days. Um, uh, you know, there remain uh, lots of trials. The Moderna vaccine in the U.S. is preparing for a phase three kind of large scale trial to start probably in July. Um, and so that's exciting, but still going to sort of take months. Um, not a lot else to report on, but that's not because there's not a lot happening. It's just because these things take time. Yeah, no, definitely. Okay, well, I see we are out of time. Um, these sessions always fly by. Um, thank you so much, Peter, for sharing your expertise um, and thoughts with us, as always. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, any questions you have, um, we would love to revisit them next week, um, basically at the same time, same place. Um, and we look forward to seeing you then. So stay safe, stay safe and stay well in the meantime. And, and thank you, Peter.